Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is uh, wonderful to see you all here at the Higgins Hotel and Conference Center for our 15th International Conference on World War II. Uh, for those of you that I, I don't know, I'm, I'm Stephen Watson, and I have the privilege of being the president and CEO here at the National World War II Museum. And uh, I just want to start by saying I think we've had a great day uh, already with our pre-conference symposium on resistance. And tonight, of course, we will officially kick off the conference in a fantastic way with Richard Overy and Alex uh, Ritchie. So we are, uh, of course, fortunate to have all of you, our, our 300 uh, participants here uh, for uh, the conference. And I think as Rob Satino uh, said this morning, it feels like a, a family reunion when you walk into the room. So many familiar faces, so many people that are proud to tell you how many conferences they've been to and uh, can almost recount every single one of them over the last uh, 15 years. So uh, it's great to see everyone here. Uh, and I also want to welcome uh, and thank the thousands of people uh, that are watching uh, online. So a few people in particular uh, I, I do want to recognize before we uh, kick off the proceedings tonight. Uh, first and foremost, I think you know that it's our tradition here at the National World War II Museum um, to always recognize our, our World War II veterans, our, our home front workers, Holocaust survivors, and, and others that uh, participated in the war. Um, and we have several uh, here with us tonight, and I want to introduce them uh, each uh, by name. Uh, first, I want to start with uh, Mr. Paul Hilliard, who's down here uh, in the front row, as always, our museum trustee, former chairman of the board. I'm guessing there's not a single person in this room that doesn't know Paul Hilliard at this point. Um, but Paul has been a, a driving force uh, with this museum for, for 15 years. And I think you know we are all here in the Paul and Madeline Hilliard Conference Center. This is one of the many gifts that Paul and Madeline have given to the museum. So thank you, Paul. I haven't seen this next gentleman yet, but I'm going to introduce him anyway, a, a friend of the museum, a friend of mine, and that is John Lucky Luckadoo, who served as a, a pilot and a co-pilot with the 100th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force. Uh, I think by the time his tour of 25 missions concluded in France and Germany, uh, he was just 22 years old, and we're grateful to have him here, and of course, you will hear from him on Saturday. So, Lucky, are you here? I know he was uh, getting into town late this afternoon, so I bet you he's here before the program's over. Also, Dr. Z. Anthony Kruczewski, who grew up in Warsaw during the war. He was a, a Polish scout fighting against Nazi occupiers in Poland. Uh, he was later a prisoner of war and a displaced person in Western Europe, eventually making his way to El Paso. And I think, as you all know, he's a world-renowned political scientist and a professor, and we'll be hearing from you, I think, tomorrow, sir. So thank you for being here. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, a friend of uh, the museum going back to the very uh, beginning as the D-Day Museum, uh, Nicole Spangenberg, who was 12 years old when the Germans invaded France. And she risked her life as part of the French resistance, bringing much-needed medical supplies tending to wounded partisans and re relaying messages to help her countrymen fighting the Nazis. And she will also be a featured speaker on Saturday. So Nicole, I know you were here this afternoon. Thank you. So um, I also want to take a moment to recognize all other veterans or active duty service members that we have in the audience. Please stand or wave. We want to thank you for your service to our country. Uh, we also have a, a number of our museum uh, trustees here, and I want to recognize them. Uh, Paul Hilliard, who I just recognized, uh, Mike Bylan, uh, Will Osborne, and uh, someone who I'll say a few words about in a second, Nick Mueller. So I want to thank our trustees for being here. 
our, I always say our, our trustees have led the way since uh, the very beginning, and it's uh, a testament to their leadership that this museum has grown into everything that it is. And Paul, I also think that you and Mike have attended every single one of these conferences. Is that correct, sir? Yeah, who else has been to every single one of our conferences? Wow, let's give you a round of applause. Okay, so I think you all know that this international conference is our premier annual conference and uh, it wouldn't be possible without uh, many individuals who contribute their time and their talents throughout the year. And I just wanna recognize a, a few folks and I wanna start uh, with my predecessor, uh, Dr. Nick Mueller, our founding president and CEO, and now president and CEO emeritus. Uh, this was Nick's idea uh, in the days coming out of uh, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, Nick and a few of his close advisors uh, had this idea to do something really remarkable here in New Orleans. It was really one of the first major things we did as a museum in those months uh, after the hurricane in 2005. And of course, Nick, uh, is largely responsible for everything that you see on this campus. So Nick, thank you for all that you've done. And we have had a great uh, group of advisors that have uh, given you know, many hours of their time over the last uh, 17 years as this conference uh, has grown. We have a, a planning committee meeting at least twice a year, and I want to recognize all of those folks that have put together this great program as well as just about every other conference. Uh, Dr. John Morrow, uh, Dr. Alex Ritchie, Dr. Gunter Bischoff, Dr. Conrad Crane, Rich Frank, Dr. Don Miller, who I think just came into the back of the room, Dr. Alan Millett, uh, our very own Dr. Rob Satino, and last but certainly not least, Dr. Gerhard Weinberg, who reg regrettably couldn't join us this year, but as Gerhard says, uh, this is his war and therefore this is his conference. So uh, Gerhard, we hope you're watching, but let's give all of them a round of applause because they're the ones that put this together. Um, and then of course, um, the conference uh, is what it is because of the speakers and uh, what a great start today uh, what a great couple of days we have ahead. We know this is a big commitment uh, to come to New Orleans, to take two and three days out of your calendar, literally coming from every corner of the world. So I'd ask all of our speakers to stand and be recognized for the great work that you do. Thank you. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is our 15th international uh, conference, and for 12 of those years, we've had the remarkable support of a wonderful partner, uh, the Pritzker Military Foundation and the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. And this year marks the 11th straight year that they have been the presenting uh, program sponsor. So literally, this program would no not be possible without their support. And it's with that, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce first uh, the president, the new president of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, Dr. Kruaski Salter. Uh, Dr. Salter is a veteran of the US Army, having served 25 years in active duty, retiring as a colonel. During that time, he taught at West Point, the Army Command and General Staff College, and Howard University. He provides supervision and control of the business and affairs of the museum and library at both the Chicago location and the archives and Memorial Park Center that will soon be open in Summers, Wisconsin. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Kruaski Salter. I've got to stop having hard acts to follow. <laughs> and I'm also talking about today, so I'm gonna do something a little dangerous, which I, I always do, is start off a little off script. So first of all, I wanna say that I have been extremely fed today. <laughs> you know, those of us who are historians, I'm a military historian and an African-American historian, 
uh, who has gone into administration and leadership. So we are removed from that research and writing. We're removed from a lot of that reading that we get to do when we're preparing a lesson plan. Um, and so sitting on the front row, which I didn't know I was gonna be student number one, the first chair, um, I really have been fed. So thank you to President Stephen Watson uh, for your leadership, for your commitment, and for your continued partnership with the Pritzker Military Museum and Library and Pritzker Military Foundation and what you guys are doing. And your staff has just been wonderful. Uh, Mike Bell and I were captains together at West Point. We taught history at West Point together, so it's great to run into him. The first person tomorrow morning on the program, Conrad Crane, was my first Raider, my first year at West Point. And um, Alan Millett and John Morrow, who I know Alan is here tonight, are Pritzker Literature Award recipients and unofficial mentors uh, to me and your staff, uh, Jeremy, Sarah, and Andrew has just been great, so we really appreciate it. And so that doesn't count against my 10 minutes, but it can. So I was asked to take 10 minutes. Um, you know, what do I say? Well, tell us what you all do at the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. So first of all, uh, we exist to inform, inspire, and engage. And we do that externally and internally. So externally, uh, Colonel Pritzker and the Military Foundation has supported the National World War II Museum with over $3.5 million over the years for this international conference for the oral history preservation and digitization program and also for the PT305 campaign. And so that is one of many opportunities that we have to engage, inspire, and inform people externally. Um, thank you. Uh, but internally, we are also a military museum and library, so I am on the military museum and library arm. And so what I'm going to do with my last eight minutes is I'm only gonna talk two and a half minutes. I'm gonna cheat a little. I'm only gonna talk two and a half minutes. I would like to show shortly a five and a half minute video about what the Prisker Military Museum and Library does. The board and staff of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library are proud to share highlights of the 19th year as an active learning center focused on military history, national security, and military affairs. As a newly designated public charity supported by and for the public at large, we demonstrate our intentional focus on public education, programming, and engagement for a broad audience. Our commitment to honor the unique, diverse makeup of our nation's military aligns with our mission to bridge the military-civilian divide through education and to help inform citizens about the values vital to maintaining our national security. Your support is crucial in sustaining our work as we continue to share the lessons of service that are as relevant today as ever. The past year has been one of new beginnings and many firsts. A modern, user-friendly website was rolled out to greet visitors at our virtual doorstep. Our members reap additional benefits through exclusive events, discounts, and our membership in the North American Reciprocal Museum Association. Members at the Courage level and higher now enjoy reciprocal benefits at over 1,000 arts, cultural, and historical institutions across North America. In-person programs are back with nearly all programs, including our on-war military history symposium offered via live stream. Later available on demand from our website, these programs add to the PMML's ever-growing video archive, which includes our Emmy-nominated YouTube series, This Week in Military History, which garners an average of 2,000 views per day. The Museum and Library's virtual learning studio launched in January, bringing thought-provoking lessons to thousands of students and teachers directly in their classrooms. Family activities are available on select Saturdays and teach young learners about the evolution of space food, how to communicate by code, and much more. 
We've formed new institutional partnerships to bring additional content to our existing audience while expanding our own nationwide reach. For example, cross-promotion with California's Vende Museum bolsters our Cold War offerings, while the Washington, D.C.-based International Spy Museum intrigues our members with espionage and intelligence. Our first open house showcased our partnership with Columbia College art students. These students displayed their interpretations of current events alongside the artist's actual work in our Drawn to Combat Bill Malden and the Art of War exhibit. Our first ever fireside chat held jointly with business executives for national security featured General Philip Breedlove, Ambassador Kay Bailey Hutchison, and General Joseph Hotel on the topic of the future of NATO. As war raged in Ukraine, we stepped up with panel discussions featuring Ambassador Ian Kelly, Lieutenant Colonel Alex Vindman, and Dr. Dick Farkas, discussing current strategies and future implications. We were honored to host the Councils General of Ukraine and Poland at these events. The Bill Malden exhibit closed this past spring, and our exhibits team packed it up for travel to the Eisenhower Presidential Library and Museum in Abilene, Kansas. Hundreds of local attendees welcomed the exhibit on opening night. This is one of several stops scheduled for the exhibit in the coming years, and the first of many future traveling exhibits expertly curated by museum staff. Our newest exhibit, Life Behind the Wire, Prisoners of War, opened in May and explores the lived experiences of prisoners of war. Drawn from the museum's collections, these unique stories highlight how experiences varied through the arc of history and were highly dependent on the captor, camp, and region of the world. The exhibit highlights the perseverance of citizen soldiers who faced insurmountable odds and unimaginable circumstances as they served to enhance civilian life. Our expert team of collection managers, archivists, and librarians are entrusted with the care and preservation of treasured artifacts, one-of-a-kind documents, and books, most donated by veterans and their families. The over 125,000 items in our collection are used to educate the current generation and are cared for and preserved for future generations. The Pritzker Military Archive Center, a helmet yawn design building, is currently under construction in Summers, Wisconsin. This new state-of-the-art facility will house these precious treasures and be made available to those seeking an in-depth and up-close look at military history. The Pritzker Military Archive Center is also the intended future home of a new Cold War Veterans Memorial. The internationally recognized design competition concluded this past spring with the selection of Orbitz, a stunning work created by Euler Wu Collaborative, provoking thought on the many complex and interrelated themes of the Cold War. Last, but certainly not least, we welcome Dr. Krawaski A. Salter, a retired U.S. Army Colonel as President of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. Dr. Salter's successful military career, strong leadership skills, academic depth, and exceptional museum professional background complement our mission. He is an asset who will help us achieve and exceed our goals. Thank you for your support, which allows us to continue this important work. Broadening our reach and sharing differing points of view enhances society's understanding of the common thread that connects us and the role we each play in providing for the greater good. Please visit us and experience what's new at the Pritzker Military Museum and Library today and what's on the horizon. Thank you. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, at the end of that video, you received a glimpse of our new logo. Uh, which will be official in January, but we put it at the end of the film. Uh, so as you watch that video, you received a glimpse of what we have accomplished this past year, but you also received an inside look on where we are going in the future. And so to our current menu of traditional military history book and author talks, which we will continue to do and bring more of them back, we have recently added a K through 12 department to our museum. We have also recently added a youth and family department to our museum because we realize that the reach of what our citizens and soldiers have done needs to have a broader audience. 
uh, just like you all do here. You have a K through 12 and a youth and family program. Uh, because tonight as we sit here, less than 1% of the American population serves in the military, less than 1%. And very few Americans have an awareness that as we sit here tonight, there is a soldier, a sailor, an airman, a Marine, a Coast Guardman, or a civilian on point somewhere on this globe. There is a soldier, sailor, airman, Marine, Coast Guardman, or civilian on point somewhere on this globe, protecting our democracy and our national security. So that's why we exist at the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, very similar to the World War II National Museum to inform people on the service and sacrifice of what those men and women are doing. So we will continue to do that with our Pritzker Military Archives Center, which we take ownership of next month. So we will take about six months to go through the punch list, to let the building settle, to do the inspections. We will begin to move items and people in there next summer. We hope to open it to the public the third quarter of 2023 or the first quarter of 2024. The majority of that state of the art 21st century museum is an archive center, but one third of the top four will be public space where we will have traveling and temporary exhibitions. Uh, it will be a mixed use space. We hope to have public programs, but the other key thing about the location of where that archive center will be is it's going to be the intended home of the Cold War Veterans Memorial, which again, you received a glimpse of that. Uh, we have already selected the design team and we hope uh, in the next decade or so, uh, we will begin to uh, start construction and it will begin to rise out of the ground. But what that means to me, and one of the reasons I was really attracted to this position, is a lot of the space that is in the downtown location and those archival books are going to be going to Summers, Wisconsin. Which means those of you who have been to our museum and you've been to our two floors, in the next two years, we are going to turn those two floors into a state-of-the-art museum to further inform inspire and engage people with exhibitions. And of course, you guys have a great state of the art uh, 21st century museum here. And so, uh, you know, we're looking to follow some of that lead. And so fortunately or unfortunately, uh, we are now a public charity. So that means I am the first president which has to go out and raise money. Um, and so that is because Colonel Pritzker's uh, vision is that she wants this to last beyond her lifetime. And so in order for that to happen, we at the museum can no longer take substantial support from uh, Colonel Prisker. So for the museum downtown, for the Archives Center and the Cold War Veterans Memorial, we will be soon joining the Capital Campaign Arena so for those of you who are members, because I have met some members here tonight, you can be members of more than one museum. Uh, thank you for your support. I'm not stealing anybody from you, Stephen. Uh, but in closing, uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity, and I will enjoy the next two days to be fed. Awesome. All right, thank, you. Yeah, thank you. Well, wow. Um, you know, I think we, uh, we take great, great pride at the National World War II Museum of always feeling like we have a lot going on, but what an inspiring uh, presentation. Um, I have no doubt under your leadership, Dr. Salter, the, the best days for the PMML uh, are still ahead. Um, and this is America, this is a capitalist society, so you can also raise money and we can, we can all succeed together. So. Uh, um, but really, I really appreciate the partnership. You, you mentioned the many things that Colonel Pritzker has helped our museum with, and I think one of the first things that I always remember when I think of the Colonel was um, in the months after Katrina, she came to New Orleans 
to help Jackson Barracks, a really important facility here uh, in the greater New Orleans area, because she knew they were devastated by those flood waters. She wanted to help them get back up on our feet. She wanted to help our museum get reestablished. Uh, as we know, she's been a, a pillar of this event, helping make our oral histories uh, accessible, get PT-305 in the water. So we just, we sincerely value this partnership. Uh, we are thrilled that you're here. We can't wait to build on it even more. And I also uh, want to convey my thanks to the Colonel, to Susan Rifkin, Roberto Bravo, Karima Cruz. It's just a great team of people, and uh, we're thrilled that you're here for this 15th International Conference. So one more round of applause for Dr. Salter. Okay, it's my job now to turn it over to your comrade here. Um, so to continue the work that he began at today's symposium uh, and to guide us through the entire weekend as our conference master of ceremonies, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, the executive director of the Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War in Democracy. He is the second longest title at the museum, only behind Rob Satino. Um, uh, Mike Bell. Uh, Dr. Mike Bell. Mike has been with us for just over a year. He started right before the conference uh, last year, uh, joined us from civilian stints with the Department of Defense. Uh, but prior to that, uh, he graduated from West Point uh, and was commissioned in armor and served our nation in uniform for 33 years, retiring as a full colonel. Mike is also a historian with a PhD from the University of Maryland and his book, on General John J. Pershing and the creation of an American staff system in World War I is forthcoming from the Army University Press. He is leading a great team. You got a glimpse of that team today. You will see more of them in the next couple of days. It's a growing team. They're involved in so many things here at the museum. Job one right now is finishing our capstone pavilion, the Liberation Pavilion, which will be open. Uh, next year when you come back for the 16th International Conference on World War II. So I'm going to pass the podium on to Mike, and I just want to say I look forward to getting to visit with you between the sessions. Um, this is really one of the highlights of our year. But with that, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our MC, Dr. Mike Bell. Well, thank you, Stephen. And, uh... You know, thanks everybody for your rapt attention today and, and for our, our panelists. You know, thank you for really putting everything into that. It's been an amazing symposium and uh, we set the bar high, but we're gonna uh, continue and, and go even higher. You know, our resistance was a great success. Uh, we've heard from some noted historians on amazing topics, but right now we wanna officially kick off our 15th International Conference on World War II. Tonight we have for you an exciting conversation between Dr. Alexander Ritchie and Dr. Richard Overy as part of the George P. Schultz Forum on World Affairs. Now, Dr. Ritchie, uh, we heard from earlier today, another tour de force is a, a professor at the Collegium Civitas University in Warsaw, Poland, and a museum presidential counselor. She's been uh, quite instrumental in our planning committee for, for these conferences. She's an award-winning historian and has published Metropolis, A History of Berlin and Warsaw, 1944, Hitler, Himmler, and the Warsaw Uprising. Alex will be joining us again on Saturday during the final day of the conference, knock on wood, for a session on the July 20th, 1944 assassination attempt on Hitler. But this evening, she'll be interviewing Dr. Overy on his most recent book, Blood and Ruins, the Last Imperial War, 1931 to 1945. So join me in welcoming to the stage, Alex, uh, to introduce Dr. Overy and kick this off. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, First of all, welcome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Salter. Thank you to everybody at the museum who's made this possible. This is the opening of the conference. Those of you who've been at the pre-conference session, turn the page, and we're starting something, uh, something very special, I think, for the next couple of days. 
Um, but I am incredibly privileged and honored and humbled uh, to be able to interview uh, Richard Overy, um, who is one of the great historians uh, of the Second World War or World War II as we stay here. Um, it's, it's just an honor. I mean, all of you who are historians, history buffs or whatever, I'm sure have a, have a handful of his books on your shelves. I certainly do. Um, and uh, was horrified a few years ago when, I, when we were talking and, and uh, you said that you just popped out Russia's war in two months or something. It was just incredible. I mean, just so prolific. But what's so wonderful is that really each of these books are, um, you know, people can write lots of books, but they're all of them meaningfully. All, all, of, all of them contributed and added to the canon. Uh, all of them have changed our way of thinking. I think each single one you've done over the years has, has really looked at history from a, from a different a different perspective in a different a different way. Um, so just briefly, um, and Dr. Uh, Richard Overy is a, an honorary research professor at the University of Exeter in the UK, of course, previously taught at Cambridge, at King's College um, in London, and has worked in, throughout his entire career on the history of the Second World War. Um, and for covering many, many aspects of it, from Soviet and Nazi dictatorships, uh, the history of air power, um, and ha is the author of, uh, well, 25 books, but edited others as well. So 25 books is just unbelievable, including Why the Allies Won, very amazing book, uh, Russia's War, The Bombers and the Bombed, uh, The Bombing War in Europe, 1939 to 1945, which received the Kundal Award uh, for Historical Literature in 2014. Um, we are looking at, and he's won various other awards as well over the years, but we're looking today at this amazing book, which is really a shift in all the other things that you've done. It's almost a kind of culmination, a, a, a conglomeration of all of the things you've done in the past and then with a new focus, a completely new perspective. So, and this is so refreshing because uh, it's, 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 a, it's a very long book, but it's just packed, packed with new insights, and it's not simply a kind of military history, it's, it just weaves in so many different things from economic history, social history, medical history, I mean, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary book. Um, uh, Richard Overy is a fellow of the British Academy, the Royal Historical Society, member of the European Academy, and in addition to this, he's also recognized, obviously, uh, as a leading um, a commentator on World War II, whether it's in journals, magazines, periodicals, newspapers, films, documentaries, I could go on and on. Um, so so uh, uh, with that introduction, which is really a drop in the bucket for this remarkable career, uh, I'd like to get on then to, to this book, Blood and Ruins. And I know I'm aware of the fact that many of you haven't yet had the chance to, to read it, to, to get hold of it and read it. So for those of you who have, I'm, I'm going to try and sort of skirt between the two. It's a very complex book, um, but I'm sure that, um, that we, will, we will make our way through. And, and just looking through that incredible history of yours, your remarkable career, um, I just wanted to ask you what started your interest in this subject? What, what made you dedicate you know, really your whole academic life to this, to the subject of the Second World War? And I, we, we're in a, in a room of, of like-minded thinkers, but what was it that sparked your interest and that got you uh, really along this path? Well, everybody, I mean, I'm often asked this question because people assume there must be some special moment or, or uh, event in my life uh, which pushed me in that direction. Uh, I, I think really what pushed me there is that, you know, I was, I'm, I was fascinated from, from early on as a student by the 20th century and the terrible things that happened in the 20th century. And I felt that I wanted to write history about things which involved big questions and needed big answers. Um, I mean, I could have gone off and, you know, done something on, um, you know, uh, 19th century Britain or you know, 17th century something. Um, but to me, the things that happened in the 20th century are big, big things um, to which we have to keep coming back. Um, you know, we can't be satisfied with the answers we've got. We need to keep coming back. Uh, and thinking again and putting things into fresh perspectives. And that's what I've wanted to do, I think, most of my career. I just, I like history, which makes you ask questions. Mm. Um, and also a history where you're constantly chasing the answer. You know, we all know that in history there are no fixed answers. And I think that's one of the things I like about this, that you can constantly move forward in this subject as well. 
Well, what's also interesting is that you've merged, in a way, the history of the Second World War with, in a way, that overarching history that's always in the background for anybody who's like Canadian and British, that's in the background of, of our past as well. And somehow you've started to ask really interesting questions about that imperial past, which, in a way, growing up in, in the UK, is somehow taken for granted. And I think that what made you sort of start to look toward that past and meld it in with the Second World War? Well, I mean, I, I probably need to explain a bit for the audience, particularly people who haven't read the book, of course, is that my, my, my focus here uh, is very different, I think, from conventional history of the Second World War, because I didn't want to write another one of those, and I've written quite a lot anyway. Um, I didn't want to write a, a, another conventional history. Um, and I was more and more impressed over recent years with the development of global and imperial history, which is where a lot of very bright historians work. Uh, thinking globally, looking back at empire as a, as a system, rather than something tacked on to the history of Britain or the history of France or the history of Germany. Um, and I, I thought this was the ideal way to frame the Second World War, rather than seeing it, as I think many people have done, as simply the aftermath of the First World War. You start with Versailles, go on to Hitler, uh, you go on to the, the outbreak of war. Very Europe-centric. Europe mm. um, uh, and not really thinking, I think, very much about uh, about the longer-term origins. And I wanted to frame the war as the end point of a long period of European imperial history, European imperial expansion, mm. um, in, in which it was assumed that they would dominate the world, that they had some kind of mission uh, to dominate the world. And from the late 19th century, almost all those parts of the world that hadn't yet been co colonised were colonised by the British the French, the Dutch, the Belgians, the Germans, the Italians, and so on. And that became, for a whole generation, Hitler's generation, Mussolini's generation, that became the way in which you thought about yourself as a great power. Mm. What is a great power? A great power is a great power defined by having an empire. Having an empire means you are a superior race, and it means you can somehow or other uh, export your culture and civilization to other people. And that paradigm, it seems to me, is exactly what the Germans, Italians, and Japanese tried to do in the 1930s. Uh, these are three countries uh, resentful at the outcome of the First World War. Germany loses her colonies. Italy doesn't get the one she's promised. Uh, Japan is forced uh, by Wilson and others to leave China. They're resentful countries. Um, and after the aftermath of the, of the Great Depression, the economic depression, they're all countries where radical nationalist circles say to themselves, you know, this isn't any good. The international economy doesn't work. You know, we're secondary powers. How are we going to become great powers again? And we become great powers by building a territorial empire. Mm -hmm. And it's a territorial empire, it seems to me, to be the critical factor in explaining what happens in the 30s. You have a territory where you have uh, resources to exploit, somewhere to send your population, um, people who will work for you or buy your goods. Uh, and so the Japanese think about China. They then begin to move on and think much more about uh, the whole of Eastern and Southeastern Asia. The Germans begin to look uh, to Central Europe and uh, even beyond, uh, a view represented by Hitler but not created by Hitler. Uh, Mussolini begins to think about an Italian empire in the Mediterranean, uh, North Africa, the Middle East, and so on. And that's what they do. Japan occupies Manchuria, goes on to occupy more of China. Um, uh, the Italians invade uh, Ethiopia uh, and start to turn their eyes to Sudan and Egypt. Uh, and Germany, of course, absorbs Austria, uh, then Czechoslovakia, then war with Poland. So by 39, I think one of the things I'm arguing, but by 39, we already have the shape of a new wave of imperialism, violent imperialism. And the Second World War, it seems to me, is really about those states which set out to reverse that, turn back the tide. Uh, now, Britain finds itself alone during that, by 1940, after the defeat of France in 1941, doesn't quite know how it's going to cope. Um, but at that stage, the three Axis powers, it seems to me, have realised that they can't build these empires, and they're rather, I mean, they're fantastic empires. I mean, who could imagine you could carve out a huge territorial empire in the 1930s? They're, they're, they're fantasy empires, as one historian has called them. Uh, but you can't do that successfully 
without confronting the Soviet Union and the United States. They would rather not. They would rather have kept them in, you know, at, at arm's length. Mm. But they can't. Um, so Germany attacks the Soviet Union, Japan uh, attacks the United States. And after that, you have this extraordinary coalition, Britain, the United States, the Soviet Union, and we should add China, a key anti-imperial power, all committed to ending those territorial empires. And the war goes on so long, I think, because it's so violent, because the Germans and the Japanese particularly do not want to give up what they've got. Mm. So they don't want to give it up, and they are prepared to fight until the very end to make sure that they can hold on to those territorial empires. It's a fantasy again. It doesn't work. So when you're framing the book, you start on a, a sort of looking over at the Second World War, and you say, well, what are the preconditions that we've always looked at? We just take for granted when we're starting our looking at the First World War, and you bring in a different chronology. You bring in much more of a global perspective. What are the things that you, the four things really that you you, you tackle before you even get into the into the details about the Italians, Germans, and, and uh, Japanese uh, when you're actually looking at the overall structure of this work? Well, I mean, the imperial angle seems to be the most important. But yes, the chronology thing is important because I've started it in 1931 with the Japanese occupation of Manchuria because otherwise you don't get what I've talked about in the 1930s. Which it's the 1930s you had the drive for territorial empire. And that's what the British and the French and the later on the Americans and the, and the Soviets are having to react to. And so I thought the chronology, conventional chronology of the Second World War, is no longer very useful. Um, also, the book goes on beyond 1945, onto the 1960s and the unraveling of all the other empires. Um, now, my publisher wouldn't accept a different day from 1945, they accepted 1931 with some reluctance. <laughs> but they said that people won't understand that this is a book about the Second World War, unless you don't have one of the dates. So we got 1945, but actually, the last chapter goes on to the 1960s. Uh, and because the Second World War is about the unraveling of all the empires, not just Germany, Italy, and, and, and Japan. The other thing I, I wanted to do was to make it clear that this is a global war. Uh, and although more of, of the recent general history of the Second World War have begun to acknowledge that, um, you know, there are large parts that are missing, and, and I, I wanted to include a great deal more about Asia, mm -hmm. particularly. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't have done that 20 years ago. There have been a huge increase in, in high-quality publications on the Asian War mm -hmm. and Japanese imperialism, which we heard about, in fact, earlier today. Um, and you know, uh, uh, once, once that kind of material is available, it's no longer possible to see the war simply in Eurocentric terms. You have to see the war as a really global war. Mm. And the other thing I wanted to do was to, the fourth thing, is, uh, is to see this as a, a number of different kinds of war, um, and in particular, uh, civilians at war. And we've heard a lot about that today with the resistance stories. But this is an extraordinary war because it's the first major war in modern, uh, in modern history in which civilians don't think that when their military are defeated, it's the end of the war. Mm. They think the war goes on. Uh, they think that civilians have a responsibility. Um, and so you have civil defense, which mobilizes millions of people worldwide against bombing. Uh, you have resistance wars, um, which, uh, uh, again, it's an extraordinary novelty, people thinking to themselves that they can, they can, can confront the occupier with armed violence. And then civil wars, of course, because the, the, the grander war, if you like, opens up all kinds of, of conflicts within states, whether it's in Greece or whether it's in Italy or whether it's um, in, in Ukraine um, or uh, in China. Um, and so civilians are involved at all these different levels. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that explains, of course, partly why civilian casualties are so much higher than military casualties in the Second World War. I was confused a little bit about, and, and this is be needing clarification, I suppose, between the, 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 this definition of imperial and colonial, and I, I was looking, for example, at, let's say German history, where Bismarck said Germany is a satiated state, he wasn't really interested in going into Africa and so on, and he was interested in 
Germany's position in Europe, this huge new empire, and, and was, if anything, interested in Central and Eastern Europe. They'd already, you know, Frederick the Great already had chunks of Poland and so on. And it was really, if you think of that colonial project, you think of, of uh, um, Kaiser Wilhelm II, who starts building the navy and going off and annoying the British and everything else, and wants his place in the sun. And in a way, Hitler, um, despite, okay, they mess around with Madagascar and Africa once they win against France, and it's a bit of a you know, sideshow, but actually his real motive is to get Central Europe, to get back what he considers to be theirs, which is the bits that were taken away after World War I, plus the places he considers to be Ur-German, you know, Drangnach, Austin, the Teutonic Knights, and all that kind of fantastic nonsense. Um, but which, you know, so which side do you see that German imperial project, or are they just both sides of the same coin? Is it, is it, is it Kaiser Wilhelm II's definition of the imperial project, or is it Bismarck's or, and Hitler's? Which project are we talking about when we're talking about the upstart German post-World War I empire building? Yeah. Well, it's not the colonial vision, because Hitler turns his back on that. He doesn't want to know if he's colonial empire. Um, and indeed, as we know, right up through the 1930s, he's happy for Britain to have its colonial empire overseas. You do that. Um, now, Hitler's view is, is a, a view of, of Central and Eastern Europe. That would be an area for German domination. And it's quite, I mean, interesting, he's, a, he's a, 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 you know, originally the subject of the Habsburg Empire, of course, which has this huge empire, of course, to the, to the East. I think often that influences the way in which Hitler thinks about geopolitics. Um, but from very early on, his, his view of, of expansion is the other side of the coin. Uh, which many people before 1914 in Germany are also thinking about, that the natural place for German expansion is into Eastern Europe. There are German minorities there, many of them. It's an area defined as an area of German culture and influence and so on. Now, what, you know, what more sensible than that Germany should carve out an empire in Eurasia while the French and the British have their empires you know, overseas? They can have that, but I want to have my empire in Eurasia. Mm. And that's really where, where Hitler's vision is focused. Mm. So it is, in that sense, goes back to that 19th century yeah, report. Yeah, yeah. No, there are interesting continuities there. Yeah. You make the point that the crash of 1929 really ends any real attempt at uh, any kind of world order, I mean, League of Nations, all the ideas that were the kind of uh, ideals, in effect, that were at the end of the First World War. But in a way, where does this economic nationalism fit in with this imperial project? What, what, what is shattered by the crash uh, that perhaps wouldn't have been had that not happened? And how does it fit in with your thesis? Well, I mean, the problem is the world economy doesn't really recover in the 1920s, from where it got by 1914. Um, and Germany and really Japan are all uh, vulnerable economies and that when the crash comes, they hit very badly, Germany and Japan in, in particular. Uh, and it links with empire simply because in all three states, they developed the idea not only that an empire defines them as great powers, but that an empire is also, uh, also provides the opportunity to develop a large area economy, a protected area, which you dominate yourself, mm -hmm. like the sterling area or the franc area or you know, the dollar area in the new world. Um, and in all three states, they, they talk a lot about this. I mean, in some ways, it's central to the imperial project that you construct a world now of, of um, economic blocks, each of them protecting them, you know, protected you know, militarily and so on. Uh, the Japanese in East Asia, Germany in Eurasia, uh, Italy in the Mediterranean and, and North Africa. So there's an intimate connection between the economic crash the conclusions that these three states draw from that and their decision in the 1930s to embark on territorial mm -hmm. conquest. Mm -hmm. Japanese think that Manchuria will provide uh, a, a, an area for six million Japanese peasants. They can go off and farm in Manchuria. Uh, Mussolini thinks that, that two million Italians will all want to go to Ethiopia. Though why you would think that, of course, when most Italians, <laughs> most Italians had come to the United States. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and in Germany, too, the idea is that you, know, that you will colonize these areas. That, um, and in fact, colonizing the area turns out to be extremely difficult. There's very few Germans volunteered to go east for obvious reasons. But that was, you know, that was, that's a driving force, create a, a big area of economy, as it was called, yeah. um, which you could dominate yourself. And then you can say to the British and the French and the Americans, here we are. 
were equal with you. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, it, I, I'm wondering if it's almost a warning from history that the that the uh, from the failure of the League of Nations, because you mention uh, throughout the book the examples, for example, when nobody stood up to Mussolini going into Abyssinia, for example, or nobody standing up to the invasion of Manchuria, nobody standing up to Hitler going to the Rhineland. Um, do you think that that history could have been changed had the international community stepped up to plate and done what we were supposed to have done through the League of Nations? Was there a, was there a hope or was it, was it all over already? Well, I don't think there was a hope, no. I mean, you, could, you can imagine in all three cases, it's extremely difficult for the big league states, and we're really talking about Britain and France, not talking about anybody else. Nobody else would, uh, would, would do it. They might follow their lead, but nobody else would do it. But for Britain and France, with big, vulnerable empires stretched out, expensive to police, um, you, you, you're not quite sure which threat you should be facing. Japan in Asia, Mussolini in the Mediterranean, Hitler, which, who by 36, 37 clearly is a threat. Um, and I think, in, the, in a sense, you know, appeasement is really the long way of looking at it. I mean, they are, they are paralyzed by the security crisis. Yes. Um, and they, it takes some time before they work out that the answer, perhaps, to that security crisis is to confront Germany mm -hmm. militarily, which is what they do. And that's, as it turns out, the worst decision, yeah. uh, because within nine months, France has been uh, defeated, Britain is alone, and the three Axis powers signed the Three Power Pact in September 1940, saying, you know, we're going to divide the world up ourselves. Um, so, you know, it's difficult to see how they would have reacted in, in the 1930s. And there are plenty of times since 1945 where we say to ourselves, well, if only the West had done X, mm. you know, how much better things would be. But it's never as easy as that. And you say it's, it's almost an imperative through the Italians, the, the Germans and the Japanese, when you say that... Uh, Lenin and Wilson sort of stalked their, uh, stalked their ambitions. Uh, what did you mean by that? And again, was this, was this uh, almost a foreboding that it had to occur this way, you know, that, that, that well, they I felt think they had was, to act? Uh, it quickly. was a strong sense that there was a window there in the 30s, they thought, uh, and they had to climb through that window as quickly as possible before the Soviet Union became too powerful or before the United States decided to intervene in the wider world. Um, so, so uh, you know, the Soviet um, focus on industrialization, the great terror, in other words, on, on internal politics, and American isolationism suited these three powers, because they thought they could carve out the empires before the Soviet Union and the United States became too strong or too threatening. So act um, fast. Yeah, they were wrong, of course, but, um, but, but that's, I mean, you know, so that, that yeah, Lenin, Lenin and Wilson are there. Lenin, you know, for, for um, uh, uh, you know, the spread of communism and the end of, end of empire. Um, Wilson for you know, self-determination or whatever, you know, you, you look at it. But, but, but the, the idea that somehow you know, the, the Soviet Union and America w will play a very important part in, in the future. So you've got to do what you've got to do before it happens. Mm. And you also say something I think is really quite controversial, and it might be interesting to get your view on it. You say the future shape of the Second World War was determined not by German ambition in Eastern Europe, which had triggered the conflict, uh, but by the Anglo-French Declaration on the 3rd of September. But I mean, couldn't you just as well say um, that it was determined by know, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact or by the uh, Japanese-Soviet Pact? I mean, why this particular, you know, there's so many things that are also happening at the same time. So why, yeah. is, why is it this in particular that you... Focus on. Uh, well, of course, as you know better than I do, of course, really the, the, the critical thing is Poland. So the critical thing is to guarantee, which um, the Polish government didn't expect, the French <laughs> government didn't expect, and which, the, which Chamberlain makes uh, in alarm in May, in March, rather. And having made the guarantee, they're locked into that particular crisis. Um, and it was impossible to tell which way. Hitler was going to move, mm -hmm. so they have to guarantee Romania as well, and, and uh, they, you know, they worry about where the Germans will move next. But they both made their mind up that whatever happens, when Germany moves into fresh territory, it, it will be a question of um, pulling back or war. Um, and so the other things, well, sort of with the top pact and so on, I mean, in the end, don't make much difference, because mm -hmm. when, when Hitler does invade Poland, thinking the British and French won't act, mm -hmm. Um, they finally called his bluff. 
Well, I would date that back to February and March 1939. Okay. Um, and Hitler's given plenty of signals all the way through the summer. I mean, m many historians focus on the signals which seem to suggest that the British want to compromise, that, you know, they're happy to carry on trading, et cetera, you know, can't we sort this out, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, but in fact, the signals that are coming to Berlin, particularly from von Dirksen, the, the ambassador in London, are, you know, you got it wrong. The British are determined, you know, you do anything else, no. the British will go to war. You uh, look at the, uh, the first half is sort of more, I suppose, going through the, the com more conventional history step by step, and then the second half is, is really looking at the, I suppose, the emotional geography very much of the war. What it, means when the world goes to war, what it means not only in the military history or, you know, so on, geographic and so on, uh, diplomatic, but also what it means to human beings, individual human beings, each single one of them who had a story in this war. And, and of course, because the numbers are so high in this war and it covers such a huge swath of territory, it's very difficult for historians to ever get any sort of measure of that. And I think what you do magnificently in this book is actually try and bring it back to what does it mean to people from all over the globe to all of a sudden have to face this sort of violence. Where did you get that perspective from? Well, again, I mean, I've relied, I mean, quite a lot on, on a great deal of very good recent writing, which really does, again, only go back 10 years. I have to say that I couldn't have written this book even 10 years ago. Mm. There's so much good material that's come out in the last 10 years. So. Mm. Um, but people have started to, to look at the history of uh, psychiatry and, uh, and psychology during the war. Much more attention is being paid to the traumatic effects of war and the people who are engaged in it, much more than before. Because, you know, much of the early writing, of course, always assumes that, you know, that, well, you don't even talk about the people very much. You move divisions around on a map. Yeah, exactly. um, uh, uh, or you assume that, you know, that the people doing the fighting are coping with it somehow or other. Mm. Um, but in fact, they don't. I mean, uh, these are mainly civilians mobilised into armed forces. Most of the regular armed forces, uh, well, like in the Russian Soviet case, are killed off, in fact, in the first mm. uh, three or four months of the, of the campaign, or captured. Um, the, the, the armed forces that are fighting this war are civilians in uniform who come from a wide range of backgrounds who didn't expect to be fighting. Yeah. They're trained, uh, they're told that, you know, now you can legitimately go off and shoot somebody. Um, and for a lot of people, this is, I mean, quite clearly, given what a broad spectrum of personality you have in any population, you know, it's going to be a traumatic thing for many people. And a lot of the recent research, for example, has, has shown that many people who had psychiatric problems or had psychiatric breakdown um, hadn't even yet seen combat. It happened because they didn't like the military establishment and what the military did to them. Mm. Um, and you can see, I mean, you know, you know once, you, once you, you know, a civilian, you're suddenly put into uniform and, and you're, you're trained, pretty tough, tough training, mm. you lose your identity in many ways. I mean, you've got to do a lot of things you wouldn't otherwise want to do. Um, now, most people do do it, but, I mean, what I've, I've tried to write about is how do they cope with that? And we also know that a very high proportion didn't cope. Um, the percentages of people in the US, Canadian and British Armed Forces who were deemed to be psychiatric casualties is a high proportion. Mm -hmm. In Germany, Japan and the Soviet Union, you could be a psychiatric casualty, but you did so, um, uh, well, you, you did so at great risk. Um, in Germany, they had no real category of it, so they were given a couple of days rest and pushed back. Yeah. Those who couldn't cope had real shell shock, were sent back home, often to work camps, mm -hmm. uh, which are not much better than concentration Some camps. Some killed. Um, and the Soviet Union, uh, well, you were shot. Mm. Um, very large numbers, you know, people who were accused of cowardice, desertion, whatever, mm. uh, were shot, which kept you know, focus the mind of the people who were still there. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> but wherever you look, yeah, you, you see that for, you know, for a great many people, in, in, particularly in the army and particularly in the infantry, which tend to take the highest, did take the highest casualty rates and so on, uh, that to keep fighting is, is, a, is a terrible strain. Yeah. In the end, the British and American, Americans took psyche, psychiatric and psychological advice to find out how many days um, they thought a soldier could stay in combat. Mm -hmm. um, and the British thought 
probably something like 200 days, but after that, you know, even the finest soldier would break down. You just cannot keep going. The Americans uh, thought that this was a much, uh, a much lower number, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, but it didn't make a great deal of difference, in fact, because, you know, when people were at the front line in Normandy and pushing their way to Germany, well, you know, you couldn't afford to, to say, well, your 60 days are up, you know, you can go back home. No. Um, and the same is true of, the, of the, you know, the bombing crews who were told you were only going to do 25 missions, then, well, maybe we'll make it 30 missions. Actually, if you do survive and your survival chances aren't high, well, do you mind doing another 30 missions after that? Yeah. Um, yeah, you, you need the personnel, of course, so you can't, you can't be generous. But what's interesting, I think, is that they've already become aware of it. How long can people stand this kind of strain? Mm. And, uh, and why is it that a perfectly uh, good soldier or NCO, uh, after three or four months of continuous combat in France or in Italy, what it is, breaks down? Mm. They break down because, you know, your human body can only take so much. Yeah, one of the wonderful things about the book is, the, is we've talked about this already, the global nature of it. We talk about the millions of Chinese people, people very often traditionally looking at World War II haven't looked at, and so on. And also uh, draw on a lot of the more recent research on the Holocaust. Um, where does that fit into, the, into your book, and how do you try and approach that subject in a different way? Um, well, I mean, I have a confession really to make. I think that for a long time, like so many Western historians of the war, uh, the Holocaust was always treated as something separate, that you couldn't, in fact, integrate them. And there are uh, some very good general histories of the Second World War, where there's often a small chapter in the middle of the Holocaust. Yeah. Um, but it's impossible, in fact, in the German case, and to separate it out from the war effort, partly because Hitler thinks that it's the Jews that have made Britain and France uh, declare war. He thinks it's the Jews that are driving Roosevelt to, uh, to uh, uh, aggressive acts in 1941. He thinks that it's the Jews in Moscow who are conspiring to threaten Europe with Bolshevism. Um, and so for Hitler, the war against the Jews is not something separate, you know, the war and the war against the Jews. He integrates them. Mm -hmm. The war against the Jews is the, a, a war against uh, a world conspiracy which has brought the other powers to fight Germany, and so the Jews deserve what they get. So what I've tried to do, I think, this time is to weave that story much more into the general narrative of the war, where I'm dealing with Germany, or indeed with other European powers that abetted Germany in the Holocaust, of course, of which there are many. Um, because it, it is an integral part of the war. For, for Germans, the German society was an integral part of the war. They knew it, the, sh the Jews were being shipped off. Mm. They knew their Jewish neighbours had disappeared. They didn't ask very many questions about where, um, but, but they knew uh, that the Jews for the, uh, the Nazi party and for Hitler were a special factor in the war. Uh, and I wanted to convey that sense that, you know, for, for the German war, for uh, Holocaust and fighting the military war are much more integrated than one would assume. Um, I see that we're, we're very rapidly running out of time because I think people want to ask questions to you, but there's one last uh, uh, question is, is that if you live in Central Europe, you would probably not see the Russian Soviet or c current Russia as a non-imperial uh, power, that, that, that somehow, yes, it's defined differently and maybe Stalin put a Band-Aid on it saying it's communism and so on, but actually that, that there's always been this sort of Russian or Soviet however you combine it, interest in dominating Central Eastern European lands and that nothing has changed. How do you see the war with Putin fitting into that imperial project or is, is that a, does that fit at all into your thesis? Well, I mean, one of the interesting things about, about Ukraine's history and across this period, as you well know, of course, is that poor Ukraine had been raked over three or four times from 1918 onwards, from the German conquest across Ukraine to the uh, Bolshevik uh, um, revolutionary armies that swept across Ukraine. Um, the Germans going one way, the Soviets going the other. And here is Ukraine again at the, at the heart of, uh, of, a, of a conflict. And it's terribly tempting, I think, to see uh, parallels between what happened in the 1930s and 40s and what's happening now. Uh, there probably are parallels, but I, I'm, I'm always wary of drawing them because I think that the geopolitical 
circumstances of the 2020s are very different from the geopolitical circumstances of the 1930s and 1940s. Um, we could call it uh, Russia, you know, what new wave of Russian imperialism. It's, it's a response to Russian irredentism, which does have echoes from the 1930s, of course, all those Germans in, in Czechoslovakia and Poland who wanted to be part of the, uh, the new Reich and so on. Um, well, that seems to me to be a different kind of issue uh, from, from, from empire. Um, now, I know many people don't share that view yeah. um, and, and do see Russia as uh, having a history of imperialism going back to the, well, the 18th century, in fact. And, and the, you know, they've got you know, different leaders, different names, but it's all empire. But, but I think that, that um, it, it, in this case, it is different. A Soviet project after 1945 was the project of a hegemonic power that wanted to spread communism, and it didn't want to spread communism, that was one of the things it was committed to doing. Um, and um, uh, the countries of Eastern Europe thought of themselves, and think of themselves now as being the victims of Soviet empire. Um, but, but this was not a, 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 a you know, this was not a, a series of colonies. Uh, where subjects were, were treated as the British or the French or the Japanese treated subject populations. Uh, they were the victims of a, of a crude hegemony designed to spread communism. Mm. Um, in Putin's case, it's, uh, it's uh, I mean, he's always, you know, referring back to the Second World War to even you know, earlier periods, he's very historically minded. Right? Um, but what's driven this, it seems to me, is, is irredentism, is the resentment that the Russians were put under Ukrainian rule in 1991, which they shouldn't have been, uh, and they want to, they, and they should rejoin um, the, the Russian motherland. Mm -hmm. Whether they will or whether they won't uh, is still in the lap of the gods. Yes, indeed. And there's so many thousands of, of questions still to ask about, you, you know, you talk about the post-war era, what, how the, the ramifications of that long colonial history, how it unravels and how painful and, and slow and difficult that is. Uh, there's so many, many other things which, which people are going to have to buy the book and, and read it themselves, and as I'm afraid to say. But, um, but uh, now we would like to open the floor uh, open to questions of anybody. I'm sure there are many. many. Um, and so where's Jeremy going? Before we do that, yes. round of applause for Alexander Ritchie and Richard Over. <laughs> Please raise your hands high so Connie or myself can come to you. We'll start in the front row, second row, to your left. Sorry. Uh, Looking through the lens of history, do you think that Chamberlain has been treated fairly? Uh, appeasement versus uh, statesman, how do you look at that? Um, well, I, th I think much of the history of Chamberlain is, uh, is polemical. Um, I mean, he was a hate figure by the late 30s for the left in Britain, and he's remained a hate figure among academics uh, ever since. But Chamberlain was somebody who thought he could perform the balancing act. I talked about it earlier on, about how do you cope with the insecurity of the empire, with a home population that doesn't really want to wage war, uh, with a crisis of economic recovery. Uh, and he thinks he can balance all those things. And he does achieve a great deal. But I think what is often overlooked is that, that when the Munich crisis develops, um, Chamberlain thinks he can tame Hitler. He's wrong, of course, but he thinks he can tame Hitler. Uh, he sees himself briefly as a kind of as, as a kind of master statesman who's going to sort Europe out. Having sorted Britain, he's going to sort Europe out. Um, and when it becomes clear he's not going to, and that Hitler is really going to, uh, I mean, everything tells British intelligence now that Hitler is going to invade Czechoslovakia. You know, Chamberlain is the one who sends his emissary to uh, Berlin to tell Hitler that if he invades Czechoslovakia unilaterally, he will find himself at war with Britain and France. And that's something which is always overlooked. Hitler's at a terrific temper. So he shouts at his emperor, he says, OK, you want a Second World War, you're going to get it. Um, but of course, he's, 
you know, um, very quickly he's surrounded by Goering and others saying, no, 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 wait a minute, we're not quite ready for a world war. And Hitler has to back down and he has to agree to the Munich settlement, uh, the transfer of the Sudetenland to uh, Germany. Um, and Chamberlain is, is hailed as the, as the hero who's, you know, preserved the, the peace. Um, and there is a sense in which, you know, briefly he thinks he has postpone the prospect of European war, that somehow or other Hitler has been made to stand down from what he wanted to do. But by the occupation of uh, Prague in March, it's clear that's not going to happen. And it's Chamberlain who really steps up British rearmament, um, who is at the forefront from March onwards of saying, you know, if you do one more thing, um, you know, you, you will have to accept the consequences. And Chamberlain moves into, a de into the role of a, de of a deterrer. He thinks he can now deter Hitler. I mean, I mean you know, thought he could contain him. He now thinks he's going to deter Hitler. And right up to September, I think the British and the French between them think that their rapid rearmament in that period um, and the, you know, the appearance of, of, of their imperial power will somehow deter Hitler from what he wants to do. And it's Chamberlain who has to in the end, accept that it doesn't work and to declare war. And I think that it's for a man who is committed to peace, of course. He's seen the First World War and what it's done. He hates the prospect of another European war. Um, but he has to face the courage in September, on 3rd of September 1939, saying that we are once again at war with Germany, a difficult thing for him to do. Now, I'm not saying we should all sympathise with Chamberlain, but I just think we need to put him into a proper historical context. Thank you. Next question is to your left, towards the back. Good evening. Um, I look forward to reading your book. In, as, in the sense of, uh, it sounds like it focuses just on Germany, Japan, and Italy, but it's also a sense in which this is a clash of empires between Britain, France, until the collapse of metropolitan France, and really the Soviet Union, and I think Ms. Ritchie touched on that in the last question, which is a multinational empire, and again, to a lesser extent, the United States with its possessions in Western Pacific. Um, would you like to comment on that? And I had a second thought that the Germans, Italians, and Japanese are striving for economic autarky, an idea that's not much talked about anymore in economics. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll take the second, second one first. Uh, well, they are thinking of, of autarky, and autarky, if people aren't quite sure what it means, is, is a protectionist zone, economic zone, which is autarkic. It can provide its own resources of foodstuffs and industrial products. Uh, although most of the, the people who talked about autarky recognise you still had to have some trade between blocks. You couldn't simply cut yourself off from, from world trade. Uh, but, but that was the, the, the strategy they were hoping to, to pursue. With the other question, I mean, I focus on Japan, Germany and, and, uh, uh, and Italy because they are the ones who embark on uh, violent territorial expansion in the, in the, uh, in the 1930s. Um, after the Molotov uh, Ribbentrop Pact, of course, the Soviet Union occupies Eastern Poland, then the Baltic states, then Moldova in, uh, in Romania. Um, but they, and they do so, of course, for strategic reasons, but they also do so because, uh, you know, they're going to be able to, to spread um, the communist regime into Eastern Europe and to do so, you know, invited by Hitler, uh, something I think Stalin could never have imagined would, would happen. Uh, and I don't see that as empire in the same sense um, uh, of German, Japanese or Italian empire. Although Poles and Latvians and Lithuanians and Estonians didn't like it, they became citizens of the Soviet Union, the same right of all the other citizens of the Soviet Union. The people who were uh, colonised by the Japanese and the Germans and the Italians were not. They were subject people, subject to racial abuse, uh, subject to exploitation on an extraordinary level. And I, I think we're talking about two different things. Not saying the Soviet Union doesn't do this, but we're talking about, I think, two different things. We'll go to your left towards the front for the next question, please. When, <clears throat> when thinking about the German 
colonial expansion, it seems that they're developing a model of reducing population in Eastern Europe through murder or starvation. Are they borrowing this model from other imperial projects, or does this represent an innovation in empire or colon uh, colony building, clearing space for settlers? Well, I mean, there's no doubt it's a radical form of empire. I mean, what's striking about the three projects, as I've, you know, we could talk about Italy, Japan, and Germany, is that they're trying to do it very quickly in a handful of years, whereas the other European empires grew haphazardly right over the course of the 19th century. Um, uh, uh, and condensing it into you know, that very short time span um, re requires a, a, a good degree of violence. And the German case, uh, you know, once, once their vision is set on this Eurasian empire, the problem for them is, of course, that the Eurasian empire is full of A, Jews, and B, Slavs. Um, and you know, the last thing you want is an empire full of Jews. It's strange that Hitler never seems to talk about it, actually. Never, actually, there's no evidence that Hitler says to himself, oh, well, if we occupy Poland, we're going to have to rule three million Jews, um, having spent all the 1930s trying to get rid of the ones in Germany. Um, but once Himmler and the others start to think about this empire, they say to themselves, well, this is an empire with five or six million Jews in it. Uh, and it's also, of course, got millions of Slavs who all breed too much, and what will that mean for the German people? Um, and so they develop what is, you know, a grotesque, it's almost a kind of science fiction view of the area that, A, you can get rid of the Jews, <coughs> which they do, of course, um, B, um, those Slavs who are not useful to us, i.e. as slave workers, uh, will starve to death or be driven beyond the Urals. And uh, the, the final planning document, the general plan East, um, uh, suggests that more than 30 million people inhabiting the areas of the Soviet Union occupied by German uh, armed forces will, will die of starvation, disease. Um, and of course, we also, I mean, we know that hundreds of thousands die simply because they're uh, accused of partisan activities and so on, uh, or you know, they're in the way of German, uh, the German advance and so on and so on. So it's a radical form of imperialism with a, a, a radical level of violence. But we shouldn't blind ourselves to the amount of violence that existed with the other empires too. It's not on that scale. But before 1914, the British and French thought nothing about waging war in the colonial areas, um, often quite vicious war. Uh, after 1945, they also conducted some extremely vicious wars in Malaya, in Indonesia, in Kenya, in Vietnam, and of course in Algeria. Um, so, you know, none, none of this is on the same scale as, as the Third Reich. Um, but empire carries within it uh, a kind of drive to violence. Um, in the best of all possible worlds, of course, nobody objects to empire, or well, they're all happy subjects and so on, go around smiling and doing what they're told, but they're, they're not like that. Uh, and the response of the imperial power is almost always coercion. Our next question is to your right, towards the front, please. please stand. Thank you, Bose, for an outstanding presentation. Congratulations. Professor, on December 11, 41, to the surprise of many, Hitler declared war against the United States. You have a young colleague in the UK, Brendan Sims, who has tried an answer as if that declaration of war, Hitler vis-a-vis -vis the United States, was really a watershed event during the course of World War II. What is your comment? Well, it is a very important turning point for the very obvious reason that Hitler's decision brings into the war in Europe, the one state capable of providing the economic and manpower resources that will defeat the Third Reich. Uh, so from that point, it is a very important uh, turning point. I mean, it's always been something that's puzzled historians. And coming back to what I was saying earlier on about Hitler's view of the Jews, um, bound up in the strategic arguments for confronting the United States, of course, is, is, this, is this view that Roosevelt is surrounded by Jews and Jewish advisors, and that inevitably, you know, the United States will at some point enter the war because the Jews want the United States to enter the war. Um, and that's 
you know, it's, to us it doesn't seem, you know, if you're brought up in the kind of realist school of you know, foreign policy, it's hard to imagine why anybody would think that. But I think it is a very important point for, for Hitler at that particular juncture, because very shortly afterwards, historians um, argue that, that Hitler finally authorised the final solution. There's a great deal of argument about that, but, 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 but it's clear that the final solution is cranked up almost immediately after that declaration of war against the United States. So for Hitler, those two things are quite closely linked together. And the other thing I think to observe is that uh, uh, not only Hitler, but among the German military leadership, they didn't rate the United States. They really didn't think the United States was capable um, of mounting a serious offensive in Europe. Uh, that it didn't have enough armaments, it would take years before they would be armed. And anyway, um, you know, American soldiers didn't fight very well. Um, you know, what are they, says Hitler? They're just businessmen in uniform. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, uh, you know, it's a kind of, of hubris expressed not just actually by the, by the Germans, but by the Japanese too, when they think about the Americans and their potential fighting power. And how wrong can you be? But there were plenty of people around Hitler uh, feeding him intelligence on the, along exactly those lines. It would take years before the Americans could um, make much of an impression. By that time, we'll have beaten the Soviet Union. We'll, we'll be you know, unassailable. Next question is going to be to your left in the front. I should just add a rider to that, actually. You know, to all leaders, be careful of the people feeding you intelligence. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, sometimes it works, but often it doesn't. <laughs> um, speaking of fantasies, right? No, thank you. Um, uh, I, I wanted to um, compliment you both on a wonderful presentation and to congratulate uh, Professor Overy for a, a really a stunningly impressive book, which I'm in the middle of reading. It's hard not to be in the middle of reading it because there's so much there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Um, yeah. And I wanted to... Um, uh, I wanted to also uh, thank you or uh, uh, my, show my appreciation for your recognition or your, your, um, your statement about uh, scholars of Asia who have uh, helped to stimulate your thinking about going, uh, th looking more globally. And uh, speaking of fantasy, I think your book is something that some of us working on Asia fantas have fantasized about writing, but there was absolutely, uh, there's no way that we could uh, with, have that kind of grasp. Um, that you've demonstrated in the books. So I think maybe you were the only person who could have done this. Um, so um, uh, I had one more a, a question uh, about, again, on the, on the subject of fantasies. There's one line in your book that I, as a Japan scholar, was, a, was uh, well, a bit dubious about it. So I wanted to ask you a little bit more, push you a little bit on it, and that is this. This is about uh, 1941, when the Japanese decided to move south instead of uh, to go north, which they had been gearing up for for a long time, and to battle against the Soviet Union. Uh, if I can quote you, the Japanese preference was for a German-Soviet peace so that Stalin could join the three-power pact in a Eurasian campaign against the maritime Western powers. Um, I understand that in 1945, the Japanese, in, in, ver in very desperate straits, uh, were, were interested in the possibility of, of some kind of a, the Rus Russia negotiating some kind of a peace. That I can uh, more qu readily imagine, but I was a bit surprised to, uh, to see uh, the suggestion that the Japanese were seriously considering the Soviet Union joining the Axis. And I wanted to ask if that, where that, where that idea came from and, and whether that might be a bit of a, a fantasy too far, perhaps. At well, least hard for a Japan scholar to swallow. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, you know, uh, I've drawn on on the literature which has is, which is discussed this. Um, I mean, there were, as you know, uh, differing opinions in Tokyo. Always differing opinions in Tokyo, and there were some people who would not um, were not prepared to to uh, countenance that. But before the Japanese um, uh, uh, attacked at Pearl Harbor, um, they did wonder. Um, at a time that Molotov goes in November 1940, for example, to Berlin, uh, after the signing of the Three Power Pact, that perhaps there was some mileage in the Soviet Union joining that too, as indeed Ribbentrop hoped, that somehow or other they would create a solid uh, Eurasian bloc 
Um, what changes that, of course, is Hitler's decision to uh, attack the Soviet Union, which the Japanese are not told about. Um, and they uh, uh, wonder how they're going to react to that. But there are diplomats and foreign office officials, soldiers in Tokyo, who do hope that, you know, that somehow or other, Germany and the Soviet Union can reach some kind of agreement um, uh, in which, you know, all those powers are engaged against what they see as a real threat to the global order, to their global order, which is the United States and the British Empire. Um, now, it's not, I mean, I suppose, it, you know, again, we might talk about, about, about fantasy, uh, and it's an idea that rapidly disappears. Um, but, I mean, I've read the, the, the evidence that, you know, this is something which is being touted. Um, it doesn't happen, and, you know, the, the problem is that in Berlin, uh, Hitler is adamant that there's no prospect of reaching agreement with Stalin. Um, and, and so any prospect that the Japanese might have that they could broker a peace between the two and then turn against the United States uh, falls down. Um, but it's something that they, they think about um, in 19... In fact, in 1940, they're, uh, uh, they're thinking about... all 40, 41, thinking about all kinds of things. They haven't made up their mind yet about what they're going to do. Their options, you know, they have a number of options. Um, and, you know, the, the, they're interested in the option which might serve their interests best. But one thing they are increasingly determined to do is to uh, expel the United States as a Pacific power and to expel the British from uh, the empire in Southeast Asia, uh, um, as we heard about, as you talked about, as you talked about this morning, uh, for obvious strategic and economic reasons. Ladies and gentlemen, Alexandra Ritchie and Richard Overy. Thank you. <laughs>